This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream. When you sign up at the link in the description, you now also get free access to Nebula, a new video streaming platform that I and a bunch of your favorite educational YouTubers have built for ourselves. About three years ago, I made a video that I think to this date I am the most proud of from my whole catalog. It's called Why Enthusiast Brands Will Betray You. It's a really old video and you know very few people actually watch it these days, but each time OnePlus releases a new phone, the views on that video spike for a couple of days. And I get pinged by a tool called Track Reddit, which tells me that somewhere, usually on r slash Android, somebody has posted that video once again. The video explains a simple theory of mine of why it is almost impossible for any successful business to continue focusing on their core enthusiast audience. And while therefore brands like OnePlus are almost inevitably going to leave their core audiences behind. Since the video views have spiked with each new OnePlus release for a while now, I guess people have been feeling like OnePlus has been on this trajectory for a while now. But for me, the light bulb in my head really went off this year with the OnePlus 8 and the 8 Pro announcement. So let me explain why in the 64th episode of the Story Behind series. When I watched the launch event of the OnePlus 8 and 8 Pro this year, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. The phones looked decent, so at first I thought it was just the presentation itself that felt a little more corporate than usual, but then halfway through I realized what it was. I've seen these phones before. Sure, not as OnePlus phones, but as the Oppo Find X2 Neo and Pro respectively. They're not exactly the same phones, of course, but especially the Pro models just have so much in common that Android Central actually called them, and I'm quoting, essentially the same phones, and said that, quote, you won't find two phones that are more similar. The software is different, of course, but they share so much hardware from the chipset and memory down to literally using the exact same display panels and even sharing some of their camera sensors that it is, in fact, easier to list the things that they don't share. Primarily materials used on the outside, one of the three cameras on the back, and wireless fast charging. Although that has since made its way to other Oppo phones like the Reno series as well. I tweeted about these similarities after launch and the viewer of mine pointed out to me that the phones even share model numbers, meaning that in the eyes of their makers, both the Pro and the non-Pro models are, in fact, just two different versions of the same phones. Which makes total sense, not only because both phones are made by Oppo in the exact same factory, so it makes sense to you know, reduce R&D costs and simplify their supply chains, it also makes sense historically, because that's how OnePlus got started. The first OnePlus phone ever was simply a version of the current Oppo Find series flagship at the time that it shared a ton of components with. And while after that initial model, the two companies moved away from each other in terms of products as OnePlus decided to focus on flagships, while Oppo paused their flagship Find series for a few years, now that the Find series is back, it makes sense that they'd go back to sharing resources again. But while sharing components makes sense in my opinion, I find their current approach really quite confusing. See, the last time the two companies shared a flagship, so back in 2014, they made sure that outside of the phones themselves, everything about the two companies was different. The business, the brand, everything. OnePlus was in a sense created to be the anti-OPPO. OnePlus sold phones exclusively on its own website with an invite system to save costs, while Oppo pioneered an incredibly successful offline sales model. OnePlus focused primarily on Western markets, while Oppo sold most of its phones in China. OnePlus specifically avoided any type of paid advertising to reduce costs to the point where they actually wrote blog posts about it, while Oppo invested heavily into billboard, TV, and other advertising and bought as many celebrity endorsements as it could. OnePlus had prices so aggressive that that they actually undercut competitors like Samsung by half, while Oppo, due to their high marketing and sales costs, actually had to charge more for phones, and the list goes on. The phones themselves might have been quite similar, but everything about the businesses was different. And then when Oppo a year later decided to pause their flagship Find series to focus on mid-range phones instead, the decoupling seemed complete. There was just very little overlap left between the two companies. But over the years, every one of those once clear lines started to blur. Because as I describe in that old video of mine, the original OnePlus strategy of focusing only on enthusiasts isn't sustainable on the long term. 
So OnePlus started to emulate the strategies of Oppo one by one. Starting with marketing, they first introduced a few simple online ads, then a couple of minor celebrity endorsements, and fast forward a few years, they now have full-fledged big-budget TV ads with A-list celebrities like Robert Downey Jr. that look so similar to Oppo ads, I'd be surprised if they didn't actually share an ad agency. And the same goes for sales channels. OnePlus first went to third-party online sellers like Amazon India, then they made their own pop-up stores, and fast forward to the 8 and 8 Pro, they finally went all out on carriers. In the US, for example, their homepage literally became one big ad to get you to switch to Verizon or T-Mobile. Some of their models even physically feature a Verizon 5G logo on them, and in exchange, as Andrew Martinick pointed out, this is what the Verizon homepage looked like for a couple of days. OnePlus fully embraced carriers, which is a wildly different business model with different margins than selling unlocked phones on their own website, and again, typically something we'd expect historically from Oppo and not OnePlus. And to blur those lines even further, the two companies also started overlapping each other geographically as well in almost all of their core markets except for the US. And unsurprisingly, by selling essentially the same phone in essentially the same countries with essentially the same sales and marketing channels, the prices of the two companies also started converging. I mean, it's hard to get an exact comparison between the two, but just look at their Eurozone prices where both of the Pro models were actually announced. And at first glance, you might actually think that, hey, these actually look quite different, but look a little closer. The 899 euro price tag that OnePlus is touting everywhere is for the 8 plus 108 gigabyte model, while the Find X2, to the best of my knowledge, starts at a 12 plus 512 gigabyte configuration. Move that OnePlus up to 12 and 256 gigabytes, and you're now at 999. And while they don't officially sell a 512 gigabyte version yet, one could assume that that would maybe be 1049, or more likely maybe 1099. Now we could go back and forth discussing which of these phones is actually more worth it at their price points, but the point I'm trying to make here is that these two phones are in the same price category even at launch. And given that Oppo phones tend to get discounted way faster than OnePlus phones do, it is not hard to imagine a scenario where maybe in a month or two from now, the Oppo flagship would actually cost less than the comparable OnePlus flagship. Now, of course, those are just the prices in euros, and we do see that in some markets, especially in India, OnePlus has maintained more aggressive prices, probably because they simply have to due to just how aggressive the competition in those markets are. But the trend is clear. To reach a broader audience beyond enthusiasts, OnePlus needs to do more marketing and use more expensive sales channels, which both drive their costs up, bringing them closer and closer to Oppo with each new release. Now, as I said in my last video, I think OnePlus is trying to walk a very fine line of both appealing to a more mainstream audience and also still maintaining loyalty from their core enthusiast user base by doing things like giving their phones decently good software support, an online forum, a strong developer community, and so on. And quite frankly, I think it is really impressive how relatively well they have managed to balance the two so far. Definitely better than I thought would have been possible, but it's clear that with each new release, this balance also becomes a little harder to maintain. Some enthusiasts have already started to feel betrayed, and I bet that many OnePlus employees have also started questioning whether they still work for the same company that they joined a few years ago. Most early employees have already left the company over the years, and I wouldn't be surprised to find that some of them would circle back to the smartphone industry and would start forming new smartphone brands that would take them back to their enthusiast roots again. And this is honestly the circle of life. Enthusiast brands mature to become mainstream brands, which leaves space for new enthusiast brands to emerge. Now, much like all my other recent videos, this one too first aired on a platform called Nebula, where it also came completely without ads. Nebula is a new video streaming platform that I and a bunch of your favorite educational YouTubers like Real Engineering, Polymatter, Low Spec Gamer, and many more have built for ourselves. On Nebula, you'll find all of our regular YouTube videos, early access and without ads, of course, as well as a bunch of really good originals that we've made. My latest love is A Brief History of Synthesizers, which is a Nebula original from fellow YouTuber Volksgeist that is not just a visual masterpiece, but also a great breakdown of how the instrument works and how it came to dominate the music industry. 
Nebula is full of great videos like this and you can now get access to it for free if you sign up for CuriosityStream using my link below, which itself is currently 40% off to give you stuff to watch while you are stuck at home. On top of that, there's also a free month of trial, so it's currently essentially like a triple deal. A free trial and then it's just $12 to get access to both services for a full year. CuriosityStream is of course the service for watching high quality documentaries online with thousands of professionally made documentaries on anything from wildlife to technology, from award-making filmmakers and commentators like David Attenborough, Jane Goodall and more. It's perfect content to binge while we're all stuck at home, so sign up and once you do, CuriosityStream will simply send you an email with sign-up info for Nebula as well. Check it out and I'll see you in the next video.